And turn to Romans, Romans chapter 4. We started looking at this last week. For the last several weeks, we have been looking at the Christian life, your Christian life. How do I live a successful Christian life? I believe that all of us would agree with this question uh, or even statement. How many would agree that we have a desire to please God? How many have a desire to please God? I also want God to be pleased in my life. We looked at the very first thing to have a successful Christian life is you need to read your Bible. You need to spend time in Bible reading. You need to spend time with the Lord and studying His Word and learning about God. The second thing you need to do is spend time in prayer. We need to spend time with the Lord in prayer. We need to learn about Him. We also need to commune with God. And uh, I remember uh, I was talking to a young man today and just uh, how important it is to date right, to to, to look at the right young lady and vice versa for a lady to look at the the right young man. And man, I remember when my wife and I started dating and the hours we would spend on uh, the phone. I have a box of, of the letters and cards that she sent me and uh, uh, what she would say about me, I can't read some of them to you. My kids found them one time, started reading them, they died laughing. I'm like, what's so funny? All of that's true, you know, and, and uh, you say, what'd they say? None of your business. But, man, I look at, at, at the hours we would spend talking, and what we talk about? Nothing. But we enjoyed talking with each other, enjoyed spending time. Now she calls, What? What? What do you need? Uh, okay, figure it out. And now, some of you are going, oh, I can't believe it. I didn't say I did. That's what we, I should have put it this way. Is that not how our phone conversations have turned? When we're dating, it's exciting. Now it's like, okay, what do you need? What do you want? Is that the way we are with God? Man, when we first got saved, how excited we were. How excited we were to read His Word, spend time in God's Word with Him. And the years have passed, and now it's almost like it's a chore to spend time with God. Folks, it ought never be a chore to spend time with God. We ought to enjoy reading our Bible. We ought to enjoy spending time in prayer. But then also, we looked at having in Ephesians to have the power of God the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Not to remember the Ephesians, it says, and be not drunk with wine, where it is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. But the power of the Holy Spirit in control and driving our life is, is not immediate. That is cooperation with God saying, hey, take my life. It's yours. Everything I do, I want to live for you. I want to serve you. I want to honor you. Well, if I give my life to God, I can't enjoy life. You can have the greatest time of your life when you give your life completely to God. That's when things are great, when He has control. And then we looked at, started looking at last week, this passage of Scripture, Romans chapter 4, starting in verse number 18. Romans 4, verse 18. It says, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, speaking of Abraham here, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. 
Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification here. Now in this, back in verse number 20, he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith. We started looking at this passage of Scripture here. and We looked at last week two statements in the Bible that are, uh, uh, are great statements that ought to stop and, and cause us to think. And, and those statements in God's Word, the first is found in Hebrews eleven six. But without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he uh, that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Now, you think about that for a moment. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Without faith. I believe, as I mentioned a moment ago, all of us have a desire to please God. But do you have faith? I asked the question last week. I'll ask it again. I want you to ask yourself, do you have weak faith or strong faith? Do you believe that God is who He says He is? Is God the creator of the universe? Is God in control of absolutely everything? Can God take care of every situation that you face? Can God take care of every situation that I face? The other question that we must ponder and think about as we looked at in, in Matthew 13, 58, where the Bible says, And He did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. He did not do many mighty works because of their unbelief. I, I've thought about that through the years and this week really looked at that. I wonder how many times God wanted to do something great in my life, but I didn't have faith enough to believe that He could. And therefore, it didn't happen God had a desire to do great things, and it says, because of their unbelief, God could not. We are living in a day and age that has kicked God out of just about everything. We look at our nation, we look at our country, and, 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 and we think about why are we where we are today, and what are the reasons that we're living in such a, an ungodly society, because the church is godless. That's why. The church is ungodly. Now, uh, the problem is, is that when you th say church, that encompasses every religious group. There are some religious groups that you could say that Ichabod, that God has departed from them. You could say that. Miss Lee, if you could help. And uh, uh, that, that God has departed I pray that God never departs from this church. We are not perfect, but we believe that God is real. God can do mighty works. I was sitting in the tree stand uh, this week, and then when we were down in Missouri sitting there, and, and had a lot of time to think, because there wasn't much you could do. And uh, spent a lot of time in prayer, but I started going through, and I prayed for every person in the church. And then I thought about a memory of how we may have first met or, or uh, just uh, memories of getting to know them and, and conversations. And I thought, God, you're so good. We are so blessed here at church. I'm blessed as, as the pastor of New Hope Baptist Church these past 22 years. And, and the folks that have come in and, and some are living out of the state and other parts of the country. And just thinking about all that God has done. I pray that we never lose that. But the only way to stay strong is to have a strong faith in God. We looked at Abraham as an example as Paul is talking about in the book of Romans and he's talking about uh, the, the, the promise of a son. 
that God was going to give him a child. And, and the Bible says that he looked not at the deadness of his body. And when the promise came to him in his old age, and when the promise first came to when they first had the child, as 40 years had passed. But yet, Abraham still believed God. When you think about the things that God does and the faith it took to, to, for an answered prayer, and I, I, you've heard me say this hundreds of times, and if God allows me to continue to pastor, you'll hear me uh, say it hundreds of more times. Seldom is God early, but He's never late. Seldom is God early, but He's never late. God always follows through, on His promises, we looked at the degree of our faith. Weak degree of faith. The Bible says that in verse 19, it says that uh, being not weak in faith. Weak means diseased or sickly. It was used in contrast to one who was healthy, one who had little faith. Jesus Christ said several times to His disciples, O ye of little faith. I mean, can you imagine, and we, we, we look at what Jesus Christ, could you imagine the disciples walking with Jesus, and He says to the lame man, pick up thy bed and walk. When He says to the blind man, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, and He, and he saw His sight. When you see Jesus cast out demons, when you saw Jesus raise the dead, would you not think, man, He can do anything. He can do anything, yet they did not have the faith. He's in the ship, a storm arises, they're afraid they're going to sink and they wake him up. He was asleep because he knew he's God, nothing's going to happen. Oh, the storm may be around us and, and they might be a little rocky in here, but don't worry about a thing because I have to get to the other side. You brought that up on Wednesday night, Gabriel, with Paul and, and out of Acts 27 and the storm that came up and Paul's like, hey, don't worry about a thing. An angel came to me and said, everyone's going to be okay. We got to make it over there. Why? Because that was the destination that God had for him. And he came up and the Bible says he spoke to the storm, peace, be still. And the winds and the waves stopped and he said, ye of little faith. Now we can look at the disciples and say, I can't believe you didn't have faith, but have we not seen God do some miraculous things? Yet, we question God all the time. You want to have a successful life. You have to believe that God is who He says He is. Even when it's impossible, He was strong, a strong degree of faith. And uh, we looked at the illustration of, of the centurion who had a child, that, a servant that was sick. And he says, I'll come. And he says, no, Lord, you don't have to come if you just speak the word. My servant will be healed. And he said, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. We left off with that. I want us to look at the demonstration of our faith. The degree of our faith is always demonstrated in our life. It is always demonstrated in our life Do we believe that God is who He says He is. Will God take care of each and every situation? Will God deal with our, our personal lives, our church, our nation, our country, and all that has taken place? Do we believe that God's still in control? I was asked, uh, and I've been asked this question many times, will, this, will the election speed up? Or will it slow down the return of Christ? I believe that the rapture is already set. God knows exactly when He's coming back. Nothing that takes place in the United States will detour or, or uh, will speed up the rapture. When that time comes, God is going to return and the church is going to be raptured. God has already set that. And, and, and it's between that time that I have to look at, but God said, I'll take care of you. And so we look at this faith. The degree of Abraham's faith was clearly demonstrated and made evident in his life. Think about this in verse 19. You look at the problem that he had. How did he look at this problem? Verse 19, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. 
when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now, the particular situation be described evolves around the promise that God had made to Abraham. The promise... Did you hear that word? What word did I just say? The promise. Not your promise, not Abraham's promise, not a man's promise. God's promise to Abraham, his faith revolved around that situation. That's the situation that it evolved around. Forty years had passed since they received the promise. Uh, from all human logic, things were physically impossible for him to give seed, for Sarah to give egg, for the two to come together, and for her to conceive and have a child. It was impossible. This was post-flood. This was not pre-flood where they would have children later on in years and into the 100 and 200 and 300 and 400 years. This was in, in our type of body system where they could not give birth. Abraham would look at himself and say, Sean, I'm 100 years old. I realize in my eyes, Sarah, you're still beautiful. And she looks back and says, shut up, Abraham. Don't say that word, kids. You're as blind as a bat. I'm 9D. Do you know that's a 9 and a 0? A lot of years have passed since God made that promise. At the time of the promise when I was 50, it seemed almost impossible. You look and think about it for a moment, and Abraham looking at his body in humanly thinking here, it is impossible. But God made a promise. God made a promise. God made a promise. When you look at how did he look at this, Abraham was 100 years old, Sarah is 90 years old, and the Bible says that Abraham was well aware of both he and Sarah's body that they were dead. He knew they were beyond the years. Nonetheless, the Bible says he considered not. What did he consider not? The deadness of his body. The word considered speaks of observing something fully. A weak faith always focuses on the problem. Abraham says, <laughs> don't think so. There's a problem here. But I can't focus on the, prompt, on the problem. I have to focus on the promise. If God can make a world out of nothing, God can cause my wife to have a child. So how do we look at problems? You look at it through the Word of God, the promise that God has made to us. God says, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. The Bible says, you have not because you ask not. The Bible says, if you call on to me, I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You see, a weak faith sees the problem and asks, what am I going to do? What am I going to do about this? Let me ask, how many of you have ever had that? How many of you are looking at that now? I asked the Lord that, that, that this week. God, got myself a little situation here. Don't know how I'm going to do it. And God's like, yeah, I don't know how you're going to do it either. <laughs> because... I don't think you can, but I can, but I can. You see, he looked at the promise, not the problem. I think about the feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter 6. Philip looked at the problem and Jesus says, hey, how much money do we have or what do we have? He says, listen, we have 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. His faith was weak, and he said, listen, there's no possible way that I can do it. 
And Jesus said, do you not remember who I am? Now, you don't see that in Scripture, but that's really what he was saying. Who am I? Who am I? I'm God. Abraham was strong in faith. You see, some look at their problem and fall apart. They see no further than the human impossibility of their situation. You see, weak faith is always demonstrated in one feeling that they can't do it or they can't make it. Weak faith only sees the problem and asks, what will we do? Weak faith fills the heart with fear, with anxiety. I just don't think so. God, I just don't think so. Why? We look at the problem. The problem. The problem. Weak faith sees nothing but the difficulty the problem brings. That's what weak faith does. We need to have strong faith that God will see us through. That God will take care of the situation. You say, but what if I got myself into a situation? I got myself into a situation, or there's a situation that was of my own human being and, and doing, and God's going to look at me and say, well, you did it. You, you know, you dug the hole, you bury it. I read in Scripture that the Bible says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible also says if we call upon Him, He'll answer us. Listen, God wants to help us. God has a desire to help us, but what type of faith do we have? You know, there have been many who were afraid to obey God, and the reason they were afraid was their faith was weak. You know, I've seen it time and time again. Someone hesitates to follow God for fear that they can't do it or they won't make it, and they're right. They can't, but God can. There's many a person that was called to the mission field and never went because they were fearful of what might lie ahead, what might take place, or maybe a move or something that God wants you to do, and we say, I just don't think I can do it. But listen, with Christ, all things are possible. What does the Bible say in Philippians 4? I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can't do it on my own, but I can do it for Jesus Christ. Now, in the case of Abraham, the Bible says, he considered not his own body, now dead, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not look at that. Abraham's focus was not on his problems. He did not consider his or Sarah's age a dilemma or a cause to worry and fret. Now, I think you would agree that from a human perspective, they certainly had a problem. How many would agree with that? Humanly speaking, Abraham and Sarah had a problem. I mean, that's just, that's just truth. But he didn't look at his problem. I want to I ask you a question. Maybe there has, but does anyone know of a hundred-year-old father and a 90-year-old mother? Anyone know where they gave birth at 90 years old? I studied and looked, and I have not found any. There's been some older ones, that not older than 90, but in the late 50s and even 60. I said to my wife, she said, I said, hey, what are you? She said, don't even speak. Don't even talk. But they had a problem here. Again, from a human perspective, they definitely had a problem. Abraham did not look at his problem as a difficulty. He did look at it as an opportunity for God. Think about it for a moment. It was an opportunity for God to show himself powerful. To show him the promises. So how he leaned on the promise. Now, again, he was not considering his promise or his problem, but rather God's promise. He did not demonstrate a weak faith by sitting around worrying about the problem. How many times do we worry about what could take place that probably will never take place? 
man, I, I, I just worry about this. And we're like, why do we worry? You say, you ever find yourself there, Pastor? Listen, I'm human too. And we have to take our focus off from a problem or a situation and look at the promises of God. You know, we looked at, I don't fear the, 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 the future. I have faith in a Father who controls the future. He looked at it as, a, as an opportunity. He looked at it as a, as a way that God could do something great. He did not demonstrate a weak faith by sitting around. He demonstrated a strong faith in how he leaned on the promises that God had given him. Again, if you look at verse 18, it says, Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. When he had no reason to be hopeful, he was hopeful. Why? He knew what God had said. Why did he hope? He knew what God had said. Why is it important to read God's Word so you know what God has said? That's why it's important. If you try to live on what I preach on a Sunday morning and a Sunday night and, and a Sunday afternoon and Brother Steve teaches and in a Wednesday night service, you are going to starve to death. You need to study the Bible. Abraham knew what God had told him. And because God had told him it, he just believed it. You know, again, we've said this, I've used this before, in that old uh, song, that kid's, that kid's song we used to sing, uh, God said it, I believe it, therefore it's good enough for me. How many ever sung that song before? Listen, God said it, whether I believe it or not, that's good enough for me. God said it, that settles it. And so he believed in God, he leaned on the promises here. The Bible says in verse 20, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. The word staggered literally means to separate oneself from. He did not pull away from what God promised, but wholly accepted God's promise that it would be true. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but demonstrated faith that was strong. God, you promised it. I can't see it, but I'm yet I'm going to believe it. I believe you're going to do what you said you're going to do. I don't know how you're going to do it. I just believe you're going to do it. Forty years. And God held true to His promise. You again look at Abraham. The word Abraham, the name means father of a multitude, father of many. Again, Abraham was not looking at the problem. He was leaning on God's promises in verse 20. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. In spite of the years that had passed and the growing unlikeliness that it would actually come to pass, he said, it's all in God's hands. I've given it to you. We need to read the Bible, spend time in prayer, ask for God's power in our life, and exhibit strong faith. Faith that God will see us through. Verse 21, and being fully persuaded that, that what He, God, had promised, He was able also to perform. He was absolutely assured what God had promised would be fulfilled. Now we know that he, he, he did not, he, he had a relapse and having a child with, with Sarah's handmaid and God said, that's not your seed, that's not my seed, Ishmael. He said, I'm going to give you a son, I'm giving you a promise. The Bible says he believed. Again, from a physical and physiological perspective, a child was an impossibility. Yet he knew what God had promised, and, and he knew that with God nothing was impossible. He knew that God was able. How many of you believe that? How many of you believe that God is able? God is able to provide a wife. 
provide a husband, provide safety in travels, provide healing for sickness, to provide for bills, to bring about a revival. God is able to do all of those things and a million more things. But do we believe that? You know, the easiest thing that as a, as a pastor, now it's not easy, but the easiest thing I do is preach a message. The hardest thing I do is live the message. It's easy to say something, isn't it? Talk's cheap. But then you have to live it. That's where it gets a little harder. Let your talks, or let your walks speak louder than your talk talks. Abraham says, God, don't think it's going to happen in, in a human way, but you said it, I'll believe it. Therefore, it's settled. This is what Abraham did. You see, if God said it, you can be absolutely sure it is going to happen. Faith is simply taking God at His word. How many of you have ever had someone say this? Hey, listen, I'll help you with this, or, or this and this. You do trust me, right? You trust me. Have you ever had someone say that? Now, trust me when I say this to you. How many of you have ever heard someone say that? Now, listen, trust me. Well, in this day and age, it's pretty hard to trust people's words because people break their promises all the time. How many agree with that? But God never does. God never says something that He won't hold true to. Never. God promised it, He'll fulfill it. Not on your timeline, on His. Wouldn't have it been a little bit smarter? Wouldn't have it been wiser for God to give uh, Abraham and Sarah a child when He first promised it? But where would have faith been if he had done that? Where would have the promise overrode the problem if he had just allowed it to happen that quickly? You see, this promise that he made, faith is not a step in the dark and the unknown. Faith is stepping out on the unfailing promises of God. You see, when we trust God, it's not just stepping out in a no man's land. It is just promises, uh, 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 trusting in the promises He has. Why? Because God is able. You see, the last thing here, the development of faith, if you look at back, if you just turn for a second to Luke 5, 17, for just a moment, Luke chapter 17. And then we'll look back at Romans, Luke 17, and verse 5. The apostles are seen coming to the Lord Jesus Christ in, in verse number 5. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, if ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this uh, sycamore tree, be thou picked up, plucked up by the root, and be thou planted on the sea, and it should obey you. He's saying if you had the faith of a mustard seed, a childlike faith God talks about as well. If you had that little bit of faith, you could look at the sycamore tree and say, be planted over there and it would. Or for this mountain to be removed. It's a hyperbole saying, listen, not that that is going to, but your faith is so strong that you truly believe it's going to happen or God is able to do that. What is our faith? The development of faith. It says increase our faith. It means to place additionally add to. Now, if I were to ask you the question, how many of you have faith in God? We would all say yes. I believe in God. I have faith in God. But do you know what our prayer ought to be? God, increase it. Increase it. But might I say, be careful. Because God will. 
God will increase your faith. You say, your faith, you say, well, that's not, that's not bad. But each and every year, we ought to have a stronger faith and a, a deeper uh, love and knowledge of the Holy God. But when we ask God to increase our faith, I think of Mark chapter 9. Look over at Mark for just a moment. Mark chapter 9. The story of the man who brought his son that was possessed with demons and Jesus came from the Mount of Transfiguration and he found his disciples surrounded by a, a crowd of, of, of people and being questioned uh, by the scribes here in verse, number, uh, in verse number 18 or 17. In Mark chapter 9 verse 17 it says, And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And whatsoever he taketh, wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pinneth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. And what did Jesus Christ say in verse 19? He answered him, and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground, and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oftentimes it, ca it, it cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, if, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with, a, with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine what? Unbelief. Why? Because the father looked at the problem that he had been living with. But a promise just came. And God took care of it. He said, Lord, help mine unbelief. How many of us could say that same thing? Lord, help my unbelief. I know you're God. I know you're everything. I know you're the creator of the universe. You're the savior of my soul. But when I start looking through the eyes of humanity, I start to question, God, help my unbelief. Jesus credited the ability of the disciples as well as the attitude of the crowd because of unbelief. Christ says, if thou canst believe, all things are possible. The words, if thou canst, implies that there is no doubt at all. James 1, 6, it says, but let him ask in faith, not wavering or doubting. If you're going to God in prayer, believe that your prayer is going to be answered. Believe that your prayer is going to be answered. Believe that God answers prayer. Doubt and faith are like oil and water. They don't mix. If you pour oil on top of water, it doesn't mix up. You can shake it as you want, but it doesn't mix up. It may have oil, but you give it a minute or two, the oil's going to rise and the water's going to sink. Think about this. There can be doubt. There cannot be doubt if there is faith. And there cannot be faith if there is doubt. Again, there cannot be doubt if there is faith, and there cannot be faith if there is doubt. Again, verse 24, And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. He was asking the Lord to increase his faith. Lord, please, one of the Things that we can do is to ask God, increase our faith. Increase our faith, Lord. Have you ever gotten alone with God in your, in, your, in your prayer time? And again, you read your Bible and you spend time in prayer. Have you ever said to God, God, will you please increase my faith? 
Will you please increase my faith in you? My faith is weak or my faith has some unbelief in it. Lord, I so desperately want a holy trust in you. Not only should we ask God to increase our faith, but we need to allow God. Here's the problem. God might bring you through a major trial to increase your faith. God might allow you to wait years to answer one thing that I've discovered. And that is when my faith needs increased... God will put me into a situation where I have no other choice but to trust the Lord. I have no other choice. I was thinking in praying for each and every person here, how many situations each of you are going through. Some I realize I do not know, but some I do know. Maybe it's an unsaved spouse. Maybe it's an illness. Maybe it's a wayward child. Maybe it's a job situation. Maybe it's an unknown future of, of what you're looking at with family. Maybe it's, it's God, can you uh, bring a, a spouse into my life, the proper one? Can, can you protect my children? Can you do this and can you do this and can you do this? And I'm knowing with health and saying, I don't know what's going on. And, and the doctors don't seem to know, but I know that God knows. What do we do? We have faith. I think about... Remember when Jesus Christ is going to, to heal the child and, and the lady that had the issue of blood touched the Lord and he stopped and he said, who touched me in the book of Mark? And, and the disciples are like, Lord, come on, really, seriously? That's a pretty dumb question. Now I'm speaking humanly. If you're walking through a crowd and you get bumped by someone and you say, man, who touched me? What do you think is going to happen? You're in a crowd, the people's pushing up against you. But God knew that virtue had left him and he said, who touched me? And a woman said, it was me. And Jesus Christ is dealing with this woman. Can you imagine the man that had the child that was sick saying, Lord, listen, my child's sick. She's been sick for a long time. Another hour or two is not going to hurt her. And while he's talking to her, the man's servant comes and says, listen, listen, don't bother the father. Your child's sick. And Jesus looked at him and said, fear not, only believe. You see, when you came to me, I heard you. It hasn't changed yet. I'll still touch your child. Remember, I told you I'll come. You see, sometimes we look at it and God didn't answer it the way we thought He would in the time frame that He was supposed to. You don't stagger. You just believe that God's still going to follow through. God might bring you into a situation where it takes years and years and years and years. Forty years for Abraham. Yet we know the story. God gave him a child. God showed himself true. Why? He made a promise. We have the Word of God. And all through it we have the promises of God. All through it we have. God said it. We can just believe it. That God will show Himself strong. Folks, we need to have this faith. When God thrusts you in a situation, just have faith. Lean on His promises. Don't look at the problem. And I'll be, just, I'll be as honest as you are. How many have ever looked at the problem? And it surely was a lot bigger than what you think God could take care of. And God said, no, that's nothing to me. That's nothing. I can take care of it. I can deal with that situation. You see, a strong faith doesn't just happen. It is developed over the years 
of God bringing you through situations. At 57 years old, my faith in God is stronger today than when I was a young man. I've seen God do some things that were humanly impossible. Things that I just, there's no way, God. And God said, let me just show you who I am. Remember when Elijah called fire down from heaven and he did and then Elijah followed him and, 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 and Elijah said, stay here, stay here. And he says, no, I want to go with you. And he says, what do you want from me? He says, I want a double portion. He wasn't saying, hey, I want to be greater than you and better than you. As he was saying, man, God used you in a great way. It's going to take twice as much for me. He says, I, I want a double portion of God's power. Elijah did twice the miracles that Elijah did. Remember when Elijah was taken to heaven and the mantle fell and Elijah went over and picked the mantle up and he struck the water and what did he say? Where is the God of Elijah? And the water parted. Where is the God of the Bible? He's right here wanting to help you. Do you have faith in the situation? I know some of you are weighted down with a spouse that's not saved. Do you believe that God can save them? A problem of health or a job situation, do you believe that God can actually answer the situation, that God can answer it? Do you have faith in God? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to have faith. Not just a little faith, but a strong faith in you. A faith that we honestly believe that, that you will answer our, our prayers, that you will answer our need, and that you will take care of the situation that you promised to do. Oh God, please, please help us. See us through. Lord, help us to increase our faith. Give us a desire to truly believe in you. Lord, I pray that we have a church of strong faith. I pray myself that my faith is continually increased in each and every person here as well. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, nobody's looking around. Maybe someone here this morning said, Pastor, I don't have faith in God. I've